the rudder now. Just pull up. Just pull up. Just pull up. Jeb, pull up. Jeb, no. Oh no. <laughs> look, look. Oh, I nearly survived. Greetings and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program. And this is the second part of my challenge attempt to reach suborbit with a space plane using only early tech inspired of course by the old gaming geezer and his series a wing and a prayer and here we join jeb as he completes his walk of shame back to the failed attempt the end of the last episode i had made it successfully to suborbital space done some science and was all set to land safely and then i uh, i smacked it into the ground so back to the drawing board Right, so basically, it almost worked before, so the sensible thing to do would have been simply to take it up and be a little bit more careful, but, you know, that's not the Kerbal way, is it? Um, I decided why not try strapping a couple of solid rocket boosters to aid with the takeoff, um, because if I could get a bit more speed and, and save a bit of fuel during the takeoff phase, then I might have a little bit of fuel left to help with the landing, and, uh, well, this is how that went. Fire the rockets! Here we go! Oh, we've lost control! And of course, there are massive explosions. And and uh, all right, let's um, uh, let's call that a maybe, shall we? All right, so solid rocket boosters, perhaps a little bit too over the top. So we decide to try jet engines instead, which does up our part count quite a lot. We don't have to have the decouplers anymore, but we have to have air intakes, fuel tanks, and separate engines, which pushes us pushes us over the top. So we actually have to go down to just one goo experiment, but that's still fine. That's still plenty of science, um, and this thing should have a lot of cross-range capability if it can make it. So let's give it a try. And as we begin our takeoff, however, we realize that Jeb is still out there with the wreckage of his plane, wandering around. He refuses to come in until he has figured out exactly what went wrong, and Bill has taken over. Bill, of course, is not a pilot, and this is what happens. And so we sent a technician to see if we could retrieve Jeb, but he is a Kerbal obsessed. He will not come in until he has determined the cause of the failure. Unwilling, uh, impossible as it is for it to have been pilot error, he is, uh, he is convinced there was a mechanical issue. And so we have called in Valentina Kerman to step up to the plate and take the controls of the Whizbang Mark IV. Brakes off, ignite the engine, and we are going for a fast launch here. Fast launch, get it up in the air. Come on, Valentina. Come on, Valentina, get this thing up. Get it up, get it up. You can't get it up. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Valentina, can you land this? No, you can't. Good job, that was just a simulation, of course. So, uh, some modifications made to the airframe. We have put the engines down the center line of the center of mass. Called it the Mark V, and this one should work best. Fire up the rocket. Get us up. Come on, Valentina, you've got to get it off the off the runway before you start to lose control. And we are up. All right. Shut down the rocket engine. We're going to be going on the jets only. All right, now the flight plan will call for us to get as much out of the jets as we can, but that's not going to be very much, unfortunately. Um, as we get higher on these old basic jet engines, we will start to lose thrust. Um, and we will start to lose the ability to sit on the vertical as well. So we ride up as high as we can, we start to go up, we cut the engines, and then we don't have action groups. So we have to manually shut down the engines, losing speed all the time, fire up the rocket, dial it up to full power. We lose an awful lot in that transition, an awful lot. And unsurprisingly, um, although, you know, we weren't far off the vertical, it takes us a little while to, to arc over and burn on up. And if you look at the fuel as we go to four times speed, yep, it's draining away very quickly. We haven't even reached 300 meters per second at that point. And it doesn't look good for making it to suborbit. The apoaps rising up, I think it peaks at around... What is it? We're just about to lose thrust there now. There we go. Engine cut off and the apoaps is at 44,000 meters. Well short of space. Well short of even our first attempt. So clearly we need to work on the flight profile there a little bit if we're going to have any chance. All right. So this time we are going to take off on jets only. We used a bit of rocket thrust last time. I think we could probably get away without that. So we're just going to dial the, the engines up to full thrust before we release the brakes and try and take off on jets only to preserve all of our rocket fuel for that crucial vertical ascent. 
Release the brakes in three, two, one. Brakes off. Valentina Kerman accelerating down the runway now under jet engine power alone. Accelerating fast though, passing 100 meters per second. How fast does this thing need to be going to get off the ground? Passing 150 meters per second. There we go, look, we have left actually a nice, smooth, controlled takeoff by Valentina Kerman there. Jebediah would be proud as we go to full time speed and the craft uh, lifts up to vertical. Still not got action group, so of course we have to go through the whole shutdown engine procedure. We're going to go straight to the vertical this time and try again. Shutting the engines down, and there we go, we've cut the thrust, shut down the engines, quick as we can, shut down the other engine, activate the staging, and we're back up. A much smoother change, but look, we dropped to, what, like 40 meters per second maybe, something like that. We dropped almost to a standstill, and uh, but we're on the vertical now, we've got a full tank of fuel. Engine burning away, taking us straight up. Of course, we're carrying a lot of extra weight. We've got both of those jet engines. There's our Apo apps rising. We've got both those jet engines and the fuel tanks weighing us down, plus the air intakes, which are also will also be creating more drag. All of that's creating more drag. Anyway, the Apo apps is rising up there, 44,000. And that's it. We have engine cutoff. Engine cutoff at 44,000. Well short, once again. Clearly, this jet engine... Uh, design is flawed. We just don't have the thrust necessary to lift that extra weight to suborbit. And we lose so much in that transition from jet engines to rockets. So we're going to have to think again. All right, so Jeb has returned from his in-depth and detailed analysis of the Mark III failure, and his considered opinion is not enough fuel. So we have returned to the original design, but this time we've bolted on a couple of extra fuel tanks to hopefully give up the extra little bit of cross-range when it comes back down. Jeb, of course, is back behind the controls, as this is his design idea. This is based on his feedback, and the engine at three quarters, or more than three quarters thrust there, he's really powering it down the runway fast, using or relying on that extra bit of fuel in the fuel tanks to give him his access to space and then his cross range when he gets back down. Of course, it is a heavier craft as a result. Those two fuel tanks do add weight, and as he dials it up, taking it to the vertical but unfortunately yep you can't transfer fuel at this stage apparently there is no uh, there is no transfer option available i guess this is something that has to be unlocked with one of the space center upgrades so the boffins try and puzzle this one out for a little while and in the end jeb says let's just chuck an extra fuel tank onto the main fuselage and that is exactly what we do 25% initial rocket thrust to get us down the runway. It's running a long vehicle now. We could get a bit of wobble induced. Slowly dial it back up now. Jebediah in control once again. The Mark 7, is it? I believe it is the Mark 7. Accelerating nicely down the runway now. Picking up speed. Taking it up to 50%. It's starting to drift now. It's starting to drift a little. Jeb has control though. He has control. And he is picking it up but we are getting some ghost forces here yep the whiz bang mark 7 or mark 8 whatever it actually turns out to be obviously experiencing some difficulties possibly the extended fuselage causing it to flex around and induce these these ghost forces ghost roll but jeb is well in control and he takes it up onto the vertical nonetheless dials the engine up to full power and blasts on up towards suborbital space look at that speed counter rising up Passing 650, 700 meters per second, coming up on 800 meters per second. Of course, 900 was what we achieved last time, and that got us to sub orbit. Can we reach it again this time? There it is. Look, 900, and more than 920 actually before we got to, or before we cut the engines, because Jeb's cunning plan actually of just adding more fuel. Add more fuel, he said. Add more fuel is what we did. And look, he has actually been able to cut the engines before running out of fuel, which gives us a little bit left for cross-range capability when we come back down and for regaining control should we have any difficulties on landing approach. Rising up now towards that boundary of space, preparing to do all of our science bits and pieces before returning back down safely, hopefully, with a, with a successful landing at or at least very near to the Kerbal Space Center. Of course, we can't EVA because we still haven't upgraded the the astronaut complex. Jebediah, of course, not happy about that. He wants to get out and have a little wander around. 
but we can do uh, other bits of science, especially the science uh, that we lost last time. The crew report, uh, not worth anything because Jeb, of course, simply his crew report is, I've been here before. And that is all. That is all he is prepared to say on the matter. And that's pretty much it. We just need to, uh, to bring the space plane around now and prepare it for its descent back through the atmosphere as we uh, as we pass through our Apple apps and begin our descent back down towards Kerbin. All eyes now in the Space Center are, are fixed on the sky as the whiz-bang Mark 7 or 8 possibly begins to uh, re-enter the atmosphere, approaching the thicker part of the atmosphere now. Now let's go back to Old Me to talk us through the atmospheric entry interface. In nearly at 900, are we going to hit 900 meters per second? Oh yes. Oh yes, we're getting quite a lot of shock heating now as it plunges back into the thickness of the atmosphere. The thick, thick section of the atmosphere. It is struggling to pull up out of that. We're going through that shock window once again. Oh, look at the wobble. Look at the wobble. But the craft manages to hold together somehow against those forces. Somehow it manages to to maintain its integrity. The boffins down at the space center have done their job neatly. Um, he is not going to attempt a runway landing, I'm told. He is just going to bring it down as close to the space center as he can get it. And right now that's starting to look a little bit tricky as he is still well out over the bay. Of course, we do have that little bit of fuel left in the engines, cunningly preserved for precisely this situation. As we start to approach land here, we drop back to real time, fire up that engine to give ourselves a little bit more speed into the dive as well, so that we can try and convert that into horizontal glides. And we don't want to burn the engine too much, preserve at least a little bit of that fuel left for the final the final approach, just in case we need to get the nose up. Cutting the engine there, Jebediah, well in control here. We should make it to land, although, I mean, the... The, the craft here is moving dangerously slowly. Look at that, 45 meters per second, 47 meters per second. Fire up the engine again just to get us back up to speed a little bit. I mean, it's so light with all of its fuel tanks empty. It's such a light vehicle uh, with a big old wing. It does glide well, but it also bleeds off its speed very, very quickly. Definitely getting weird ghost forces on it though. All right. Easy now. Easy now, we're over land. We're out of fuel. All right, gear down. He's not able to bring the nose up. He is reporting, he can't get the nose up. Oh, it's down. It's down and it's safe. We lost the engine, but most importantly, we maintained the, the, the experiments. All the experimental data has been preserved and is safe and sound. He has brought it to a stop. He could actually have let it roll quite a bit closer to the space center there, but look how close that is. That's pretty good. I think that is pretty good. All right, you may argue that we got very lucky to survive that landing. It was it was quite similar, in fact, to the previous landing. The nose hit the ground first pretty hard, uh, but this time the vehicle held together. We lost the rocket engine on the back, but that is not a big loss at the end of the day. The main fuselage held together, and most importantly, the science experiments held together. And so we have successfully completed the challenge. We have been to suborbit and returned with all of our science intact and indeed with the vehicle more or less intact with what I will call a horizontal landing. A pretty hard landing, yes, but a horizontal landing nonetheless. If we tweaked our flight path there a little bit, we wouldn't need to have used the extra bit of rocket fuel that we did to get back over land. And I think we would have had a much more controlled landing. We would have been able to use that last bit of thrust just towards the end, just to pick our speed up and bring that nose up in order to be able to make a controlled landing. And so the wizard, the whiz bang, Mark 7 or 8, whatever it turned out to be, uh, I think is uh, is a successful craft. Challenge completed. So there you go, that was the KSP challenge inspired by the old gaming geezer who you can check out his channel using the handy on-screen link provided right now. All right, now I've got a little bit of a bonus bit for you because the, uh, the, the challenge was pretty much completed there. Now you could argue that the space plane crash landed more than landed in the end, but it was intact. And, and I think we can all agree that it would have been capable if I flew it again or flew it a few more times to practice, I would have been capable of getting that thing down uh, probably on the runway. So rather than do that, um, I decided to take a look at the jet engine concept again because I'm pretty convinced the problem with the jet engines before was that I wasn't able to toggle them off 
using action groups. So I've unlocked the action groups, and as you can see, this time, we're firing up the jet engines with the rocket engines, passing all the way up, look, through 300 meters per second, and what do we get to? 345 odd meters per second before I disable the jet engine. So we had quite a long period where we were on both jets and rockets, and then I was able to instantly disable those jet engines at the same time had I not done that, had I not used action groups, one would have cut out before the other as they started to choke on air, and, and potentially the, the whole craft would have been spun out as a result. That was the main problem before. However, as you can see, look, this thing coasts on all the way up to 87,000 meters. So it's essentially exactly the same design as before. Um, I did take the oxidizer out of those back fuel tanks that the jets are attached to, but otherwise it's a 30-part vehicle. It's the same length. Um, same engine on the back, everything's the same. Much, much higher Apple apps though. It goes to show just how much those jets are able to offer. And, of course, look, they've still got plenty of fuel. Look at that. We've still got, what's that, like about 84 units of fuel, 85 units of fuel left, um, which is going to give us a huge amount of cross-range capability once we return. And that, that opens up all sorts of possibilities. We can use this as a suborbital point-to-point -to, -point to a certain extent, rather than going straight up and straight back down. We can take a, a slightly longer baseline journey so we can get some distance from the Space Center records with it. Um, likewise, when we come back down, we can come back down much more shallow, at a much more shallow angle, put a lot less heat stress on it because it doesn't matter if we wind up further away from the Space Center because we've got the cross-range capability. We just fire those jet engines up, keep our speed up, and of course, as well, it means we don't have all those control issues that we experienced last time under gliding as the thing just stalls out. Uh, it just loses speed very, very quickly and then stalls out because we can keep it under acceleration the whole time. Here we go, look, approaching the Space Center, and in fact, look, here we go, it's, this is going to be a classic example of why having extra, extra go-around capability is an important thing. We've got the ability to fire those engines back up. It was a failed landing, you know, I mean, yeah, we could have actually touched it down quite nicely there, but I wanted to be on the runway. So we just fire the engines back up, use our go-around capability, come back around, line up once again, and this time we make a... Well, all right, not a perfect landing, but it's not a terrible landing. We're a little bit off the side, but nonetheless, we come to rest right on the runway, right next to the Space Center. Job done.